Thank you, Diane. It is an honor to be able to introduce Zach Kahane, who's not only our keynote speaker today, but who's the PI of the original ITB2 grant that started all of this. So we can all thank Zach for uh, bringing us together today. Um, we could, but I got to get to the personal stuff. I'm going to do the boring thing. He's the inaugural chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Harvard Medical School and the Marion V. Nelson Professor of Biomedical Informatics. He uh, co-wrote the uh, Institute of Medicine Report on Precision Medicine, and he's the editor-in-chief of the new New England Journal of Medicine AI Journal. Just the fact that we have a journal like that is pretty incredible. It's been on a personal note. It's been an amazing opportunity to be part of his department. He's a wonderful mentor, not only to me, but everybody around him. And uh, if you like his talk on the AI revolution in medicine, GPT-4 on beyond, you can read his book. There's a lot of really cool stuff in there, and I've been enjoying reading it. I'll get your signature on it in a little thank bit. You, thank, thank you. Are we good? We... Yes. All right. What a... Uh, Great pleasure it is for me to uh, be here and see um, so many familiar and more importantly, unfamiliar faces, um, which is a sign of the ongoing vitality of our community, our community that continues to grow worldwide. And I want you to appreciate that today you're gonna see evidence how having led, laid the groundwork of genuine comprehensive extraction of data by healthcare systems of their own data under their own control and that's incredibly important because the data that you extract from your healthcare systems is going to represent your best understanding of your healthcare system and no one even the ehr companies that have been introduced from the c-suite understand your enterprise as well as you do and by having created that independent and customized view while re remaining within certain broad standards determined by the I2B2 data dictionary and ontologies, you're now able to use technologies that are truly state of the art. And you'll hear much more about that today and in the workshop. I want to give you some framing, some examples, and we'll take it from there. I'm also going to rely on Diana to tell me when I'm 10 minutes out, maybe. All right. Okay. Oh, so first disclosure, anybody who tells you that they know what the future looks like at this point is lying or is delusional because truly how um, AI is going to affect both clinical care and clinical research is going to determine on many, many variables. Some are technological, but a lot of them are economic and sociological. And so it's an interesting moment. Let me tell you about old school AI. There's a child who until age four was fine and then started uh, losing his ability to talk and walk. His mom brought him to multiple doctors and um, they had uh, no diagnosis. They made multiple diagnoses which proved to be incorrect. So for several months, then years, she went, he went without a diagnosis, not walking, not talking. He was then finally referred to a uh, network that I'm extremely proud of, the Undiagnosed Disease Network. This is a network with academic centers coast to coast, including, I see members here from UCLA, from Stanford, from the Harvard hospitals, from NIH and so on. And we shove all their data into the cloud and uh, identified with all the genomic data so that patients can go wherever they need to go, which is rarely true, unfortunately, in medicine. And so his genome was sequenced and when we look at any of our genomes in this room, not only are there millions of variants, and not only are hundreds of thousands of them relatively private in the sense they only developed <clears throat> in our recent family history, 
<clears throat> excuse me, but some of them are mutations that if you looked in the textbook actually cause Mendelian disease, except they don't. And so what we find often, because about half of our patients now have already genomes, is that where people get stuck is they don't know how to pick from among the genes that look like they have, that they're busted, have loss of function. We don't know which ones to pick, say these are the ones causing it. And so we developed, as many others have, a bunch of narrow AI tools that look through the these thousands of mutations and based on conservation, evolutionary conservation, predictions of biochemical effect, say this gene is the one that's causing disease. And indeed, for this child, fortunately, we were able to identify that this gene, this gene, uh, GTP cyclohydrolase 1, was deficient. Um, and because it's uh, biosynthetic for neurotransmitters, giving this child a cocktail of neurotransmitters caused them to be walking and talking literally within weeks. Absolutely transformative. And that's a great example, a lot of effort, narrow sense of AI, and not least of all, having expert clinicians who also say, yeah, that, that's consistent. The, the clinical presentation is consistent with the system. That's wonderful. Fast forward a few years, and by the way, this network is still uh, going strong uh, 11 years out. If you have someone you know or love who has been undiagnosed, you should refer them. So fast forward a few years, and I get a call from Peter Lee, the uh, head of Microsoft Research, uh, who says, Zach, I want to tell you about something, uh, but, I uh, and, but I can't tell you about it unless you agree to keep it secret. So it'll be worth your while. Don't get that kind of call that often. And so um, I uh, talked to him, and he reveals to me this is in October 2020, GPT-4. This is before ChatGPT was released, which is GPT-3.5. And I'm blown away by it, and I don't have the time to tell you how much it uh, made me really scratch my head about what's going on. And I, you know, I would say most computer scientists, uh, but by the way, for those who don't know me, I have a, I have a PhD in computer science in artificial intelligence back from the 1980s. So I was waiting for something like this to happen forever. But like many others who had trained in computer science, I did not think this was going to happen for several decades to come. But I'll, let, I'll uh, fast forward through all the uh, stages of uh, grief, uh, you know, denial, anger, and all that. And just when I finally ex reached acceptance, I gave it a case that the undiagnosed disease network had actually not um, solved. So we got it down to five genes that were mutated. But we didn't know which one of them. It couldn't, we couldn't make a good enough case that any one of these five were actually the causative gene. So I gave it to GPT-4, as described in this book that I wrote with uh, Carrie Goldberg and Peter Lee. And I give it the case exactly as is. I don't tell it more than what you see here in, blue, in, in, in the blue type font. It, this. Uh, premature adrenarche, laryngeal cleft, hearing loss, blah, high blood pressure. And what I ask it, what's the single most likely cause? And it goes through all the genes, but it ranks them, and it gives a reason for its ranking. And it says, Pol r 3 a is a particularly interesting candidate gene, given that it is, uh, given the child's diagnosis of leukodystrophy, and Pol r 3 related leukodystrophy has also been linked to hearing loss in some patients. So very, pulling through that some very abstruse, uh, rare pieces of data. So, fast forward another few months, independently at the UDN, we knocked in these genes through CRISPR into model organisms, into fruit flies, and only Pol3 created the, the neurological uh, equivalent phenotype. So, GPT-4, which knows as much about medicine as it knows about Talmudic reasoning and about quarterback, uh, quarterback performance in the NFL, just speaks to me in medical ease about a diagnosis and make, performs a very high level of diagnosis. Now, there are many, 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 many problems with uh, these generative models. They're, they're inaccurate, they hallucinate, uh, they're not fully up to date, but I want to point out something. Maybe I can point out next. Yes, it's a fast moving target. Whatever we know, whatever you want to say about GPT, or any of the general, general models is not going to be true next year. 
the medical board, the USMLE is a test that doctors take to get their, degree, their um, professional certification. And back in tw December 20, no general model could even get as good as the worst candidates taking this test. Two years later, not one, but both a Google LLM and a Microsoft OpenAI MM, um, a lang large language model, exceeded the performance of 90% of doctors taking it. It's moving fast. And it's an odd thing to think about because our educational system is not keeping up to date with it. Maybe some of our students are. And so there's a real opportunity, but it is very much like a societal singularity in the, in the sense that this is moving faster than anything we've experienced intellectually. Um, and I just want you to consider, even though, even though, sorry, passing the boards does not mean you're actually a good doctor, especially if you're a large language model. Let's summarize. How do we know that these models are any good? Well, the traditional way, as of the last five years, of validating AI models was to define a narrow task, like verify that there's retinopathy of diabetes at the back of the eye, from a picture of the back of the eye, and grade it. Is it good, not good, really bad? And so you define that, you run a trial, and the FDA knows how to handle that. It, it regulates it as software as a medical device. And over 500 such AI um, systems have been um, approved in this way by the FDA. But that's not what these large language models are about. They're not a narrow task. They're the entirety of the, of the tasks of medicine. Now, how do we know that medical doctors are any good? Well, they go through this torturous path to becoming a recognized doctor, which involves testing, rotations, and so on. And a lot of the formal parts of it, it's very clear that these large language models are going to be human or superhuman at. But there's a big problem is these models don't walk with two feet out in the world and they're not we don't know if they have the same value systems as we do we know that they're trained on the entire corpus of human knowledge but we actually don't know what that means in terms of what their value system is and so you can they can pass a test but when push comes to shove it when you're sitting down yourself as mrs smith and asking, what should I do about this tumor? A doctor told me I need to get radiation. Is that the only, is that the best solution? You have to wonder what values are driving that judgment. And that's a very, very important question because remember, GPT-4 in, within ChatGPT was released not to doctors, but to the whole world. And already patients are using this all the time. I also want to point out there's another, so there was trial, trainee, and then there's torchbearer, like Dr. House, who are capable of superhuman capabilities. And again, you saw something like that in the case of the um, GPT for making that genetic diagnosis of that patient. But how do we know it was right? We took a whole team effort to validate it. So again, this is a tired phrase, but we use it in the book. Um, just like Reagan said, trust but verify. Until we figure out how to evaluate, evaluate these things, which are, it's going to be very hard. It may be impossible. We're going to have to have humans in the loop. But how to keep them in the loop, active and alert, is going to be a hard question. Now, what was perhaps just as impressive as large language models were these reinforcement learning algorithms, like AlphaGo, 
which beat the world champions of the game Go. Much harder target than beating chess, uh, which Deep Blue did uh, many years before. And the way it did it was not that it learned, went through a whole list of chess moves and looked X moves ahead. No, the way it did it is by playing, it, playing itself millions of times. And it played it itself million times and rediscovered all the grandmaster moves and then went on past and discovered new moves beyond grandmaster and blew them away. And by the way, we did that also for chess and for checkers and it's remarkably effective. And so many of us in medicine started asking ourselves, huh, is that the secret to actually getting medicine right? You know, that's just pour into a reinforcement learning algorithm. So for that, we have a good insight by uh, Andre Karpathy. I have to interrupt myself because I, but just by saying his name, it nerd snipes me. Andre Karpathy, think about that. He was for many years the head of AI at Tesla to determine which way your car drives. I want you to think about his name, Car Pathy. I am, that's my hobby, if you want to look up. So there's a Latin name, there's a Latin phrase, nomen est omen, your name is your destiny. So if you look up uh, nomen omen us, you'll see about 30 or 40 of these that we put out, including, for example, the doctor who defined UTI frequency after circumcision, Dr. Wiswell. Anyway, um, Andre Karpathy looked at uh, what, when would a problem domain succumb to alpha zero? He said, it has to be deterministic, not probabilistic. It's fully observed. You know all the moves in the Go game. The action space is discrete. There's no continuous variables. You're either on that spot or on that spot. You have access to a perfect simulator. The game itself is a perfect simulator of the reality you're trying to control. So the effects of any action are known exactly. Each episode or game is relatively short. Evaluation is clear. You know if when getting another person's piece is a good thing or not. And there's huge data sets of human play. So let me ask you, that's not the case for physiology. It's not deterministic. It's not fully observed. We don't have a perfect simulator. The games are not short and evaluation is not clear. It's not true of disease courses. It's not true of drug responses. It's not true of surgery. So just to keep you awake, let me ask you, what game in medicine might meet these criteria? Anybody? What game in medicine might meet these criteria? That's pretty good. Actually, that's, that's, a, that's a better answer than most. Did you, anybody have another answer? Okay, so the, the answer I, I gave, I showed this slide maybe five years ago, and three VCs actually stood up and went off and created business plans around it. Here's the answer. There's a dark side and the light side. Reinforcement learning to maximize reimbursement. Reimbursement, the rules are explicit. We know what states, what the states are. We know, we can observe the whole game. There's lots of examples of human play and no surprise and this can be true about large language models as well this is where they're going to get the biggest bang for the buck because of all those properties sadly things like maximizing the patient's utilities and clinical decision making making over all treatment achievable treatment plans is much harder because it doesn't have those properties so warning shot number one this, these kinds of technologies are going to work really well for administrative data, not so well for medicine. Um, David Cutler did a very nice analysis that he published uh, back in September 2022. And, uh, it's an economic analysis, economics of artificial intelligence. And he makes the point that of all the um, different places that AI can be used, you see in this column is potential impact on total mission value. So 
reimbursement is the highest one where we're the furthest along in the mat maturation of the technology. We're past pilot stage. Other places where we have a potential high impact, like scheduling of ORs, is also high impact, but we're much more early pilot stage. So this is a very important article because it tells us where the puck is going initially in terms of large economic impact. And for those of us who have been long enough in medicine, we know unfortunately that you have to follow the dollars if at least to understand where the applications are going. I also want to remind those of us who are not doctors or even those of us who are doctors that uh, society, the American society, in fact, society writ large is failing to uh, provide primary care. Um, as we get older, fewer and fewer uh, primary care doctors are available. And by uh, 2035, we'll be missing somewhere between 37,000 and 124,000 primary care doctors. And I can tell you that when someone comes from Stanford to join my faculty in my department, I, I, I totally fail in getting them primary care doctors. I reach out to all my friends who have been in primary care, and they tell me there's no good open practice in Boston, the center mecca, I would like to think, of health. That's a big problem. And it's not just the US problem. It's not just because we have uh, um, fee for service. This is an amazing story that I saw in the news a few months ago. Refugees who came to the UK from Ukraine, they had some basic medical needs. The lines were so long for prime, getting primary care in the uh, UK, they went back to Ukraine to get health care. Think about what kind of failure that is. And it's not just uh, primary care. I know it's a little bit too, uh, too uh, small to show it, but here, my own specialty, pediatric endocrinology. In 2020, there were 108 open positions and 41 uh, in the match, and only four, and 41 were unfilled. That means if, if we took everybody who applied, basically, we could not fill the positions. Those are the real co medical contexts that we, against which we need to look at AI. And by, by the way, it's, this is also true, for example, of pediatric um, developmental and behavioral pediatrics. All these parents who want their kids evaluated for autism. They're SOL because we're not filling the slots. And it's true of geriatrics and family medicine. And by the way, interestingly, um, it's not true of physician assistants and nurse practitioners. And so the big question for us as a society is nurse practitioners plus physician assistants, which by the way, today, today, 2023, comprise one quarter of all primary care is given through NPs. Can, with AI, can we actually augment them? And it's been shown that's, that's probably true for breast cancer screening, for a number of primary care prevention. And because the data sets are growing really fast, this is an extraordinary study that just appeared as a preprint. It's not yet fully published. I wish I could, I could get it in our journal, but I don't think we can. So the number of echocardiograms has gone up by two order magnitudes in the last three years. And look at this program called EchoClip. Um, yeah. So this guy, that was this demo, it's not my demo, they just took all these echocardiograms and it's running on the GPU right now in real time. This is the real time video. And what is it's analyzing, looking at all the notes that were ever written for all the uh, million echocardiograms, and it's saying which clinical notes in a large language model is this the closest to, and it's actually generating synthetically a completely de novo report for that patient from those echoes without any other human supervision. This is a super detailed about the valve, about pericardium, about pressures, all that right out of the... Now think of what primary care can now do with that expert level that's now been just, until now, just a province of expert uh, cardiologists. 
but what about research? How's AI going to affect it? On the one hand, it seems it might. Epic and Microsoft have a large collaboration, not only to use AI to improve the doctor experience, but also use the entire um, database of, in Cosmos, for example, of Epic to be able to study human health. But this is that perspective, highly corporate, and in I2B2, we have a user community that is fully um, independent. And I just want to bring you on a ride. We'll see how well it goes. So this is, this is last night. Last night, I loaded and I, I opened up ChatGPT. This, I'm paying 20 bucks a month for this. And it has a mode called advanced data analysis. And I took a data set Never mind. I took a data set from the F from uh, yeah from FDA that I know nothing about adverse event reporting, and I downloaded this big zip file. I uploaded the zip file into GPT-4, and I said, "Please summarize the data." Can you imagine saying this to a student? Here's this. This was a, just one quarter of the year. Uh, I think it was 69 meg, megabytes. I'm just say to a student. Please summarize these data. And it says, sure, let's start by unzipping the file to see its contents. ASCII, the, this directory contains ASCII formatted data files. Deleted, the directory may contain information about deleted records. FAQ is a PDF that probably contains frequently asked questions. Readme, a PDF that likely contains instructions or information. Would you like to explore the ASCII directory to see the data files it contains, or would you like to check out one of the other files? I said, yes, please. And then it's look at the, look at the work it, it's doing. It's behind the scenes, it's doing all this work. It says the ASCII there contains pairs of PDF and text files for different aspects of the data set. Here's the list, likely demographic information, probably drug information for the second quarter of 2023. Possibly, I know nothing about this data set and it's figuring out just by inspection of the data what's going on here and by knowing everything else about humanity. And likely information reactions or adverse events. Unclear, but possibly report summary information for the second quarter. Possibly information on therapeutic responses for the second quarter. Would you like me to summarize any of uh, the content of any specific text file, or would you like more information on what each file likely contains? I said, please focus on React 23Q3. I said that only because I read that it had the, um, the adverse events, which is what I was looking for. Okay, certainly. Let's start by taking a quick look at the first few lines of, to understand its structure and content. The React file appears to have the following um, columns. Primary ID, case ID, another identify the case. PT describes the type of reaction or adverse event. Drug set act. This column appears to be empty in the preview, but could take, contain additional information. Would you like to proceed with a detailed summary of this file, such as the number of unique cases, most common reactions? Yes, please. Great, to provide a comprehensive summary, I'll perform the following steps. I'll load the file, I'll count the number of primary ID and case ID values, I'll analyze PT to find out the most common adverse reactions, check for any non-empty. Let's start by loading the entire file. It says the file has been successfully loaded. It contains the following information. There are 1,470,000 blah, 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 entries, and it has this many uh, non-null entries, int4, and so on. Now, next, let's count the number of unique primary ID. And by the way, just in case you want to see the work, there's the work. Um, I'd work. Oops. The data set contains this many primary, uh, unique primary ID and case values. Would you like to see the top 10 most common reactions? Yes, please. Off-label use, drug ineffective, fatigue, nausea, death, pain, diarrhea, headache, products. I know nothing about this database. This is last night I was doing this. Lastly, let's check for any non-empty entries in drug rec. Seems that the drug rec act does have some non-empty em empty entries, but the, the output was truncated. The entries in this column include various terms like hypothyroidism, blood pro prolactin increase, drug ineffective, and many more. Summary. So here's a summary. 
gives me accounts for all these things, and say, would you like to delve deeper into any primary aspect of this summary? Which are the drugs most, I saw arthralgia, which are the drugs most frequently associated with arthralgia? To answer your question, we'll need to look at adverse reactions with the drug information, which is likely in that other drug uh, text file. The common uh, identifier for these two data sets is blah, blah, blah. And so let's take a quick look at the structure. And let's, let's actually do this. And it does it, does it. The relevant columns for our analysis are primary ID, case ID, drug name, and uh, prod AI. Let's filter for entries with adverse reactions, arthralgia, and, and then join it. It's doing the join just automatically with the drug data set to identify the drugs most frequently associated with this condition. And by the way, here's the, I don't know. If, oh, there it goes. That's just, you know, hide work. And here it goes. These are all the drugs most commonly. And would you like to explore more details about any of these drugs or any other aspect of the data? I'd never heard of Inflectra. So, oh, but anyway, what are the 10 most common adverse reactions with Infliximab? It appears that the merged data set, Arthralgia, is the only adverse reaction. This may be due to the way we filtered and joined data, focusing only on cases with reported with Arthralgia. Would you like to perform a separate analysis on the entire data set to find the 10 most common reactions associated with Infliximab? Because I realized it was too focused and it'd have to redo it. And it says, and it does it, and here it goes. And so off-label use, 10,000 occurrences, condition aggregated, 7,000, arthralgia, 3,400, drug ineffective, 2,400. Okay, so which drug in the database had the most occurrences of arthralgia? The drug Inflectra had the most con uh, uh, occurrences of adverse event arthralgia. Is there anything you'd like to know? Can you tell me more about the drug Inflectra? So remember, this is not just narrowly looking at the database. It also knows about everything else. And here it goes. It's medical uses, rheumatic arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, mechanism of action. It works by inhibiting the activity. Side effects, common side effects, serious side effects can include. Administration is usually administrative precautions. Note, I'm still in this. Imagine you were using a, one of these business app applications, and all of a sudden you're asking it for medical details. It, smoothly goes there. I said, what protein is targeted by Inflectra? And it reminds me, it's TNF-alpha. Here's the role of TNF-alpha. And so it's giving me some you know, basic information. Are there any other drugs in the data set I uploaded that may also have TNF-alpha as a target? It says, certainly, here are some drugs. Uh, and it gives me a whole bunch of them. These drugs belong to a class of medication known as TNF-alpha. Would you like to know more about any of these drugs or have any other questions? No, thank you very much. I think it's important to be um, uh, polite to these things because once they took over the world, if you screw, they'll remember. Actually, I do have another question. Again, this is real time. I was like, I stopped watching TV and maybe I have another one. Of the 10 drugs targeting TNF alpha that you listed, can you let, create a table showing the number of occurrences of arthralgia, the number of occurrences of drug ineffective, sorted by number of occurrences of drug ineffective? And it does it, and it's a bunch of zeros. Um, it's, and it says, which are all zeros. Uh, is there anything you'd like to know? Perhaps it's the capitalization that confused you. And he says, I apologize, and does it. And it's, um, and he says, if even with case insensitive, the counts are zero. So I said, would you like me to perform a separate analysis? It says, sure, and then it does it. And I say, do you know which of these drugs are prescribed most often? And it says, the data set you provided can give us an idea of the frequency with which these drugs appear in adverse events world, but it doesn't directly, so it's telling you what the limitations of the data sets are, it doesn't directly um, indicate how often they are prescribed, adverse event reporting database, blah, blah, blah. It says, that said, in a clinical setting, drugs like Humira, uh, uh, Embrel, and Ramicade are often cited as some of the most common. So it's giving me lots of information that is not even in the database. Can you write Python code to generate a web form to allow reporting of these adverse events for TNF alpha. Use pop-up menus of the drug names. Certainly, I can provide you with the Python code that uses the Flask web framework to create a simple web form for reporting adverse events for the TNF alpha blockers. However, please note that I can't run the code here due to a restricted environment. You'll need to run the code on your local machine to see it in action. So if you install Flask, then create a Python file, that, that's this. Create an HTML file, that's this. 
um, and run the Python file. And I've done this, and it works. If you go to the local web server at 127.0.0.1, this is a very basic example to get you started in real-world application. You'd like to want to add more features like validation, database storage, and secure authentication. If you ask it to do it, it'll do it. Are there ICD-10 codes for any of the adverse events that you listed? And it goes through the ICD-10 codes. So it knows all about coding. And I didn't have, and then I say, and it says, note the codes mentioned are for general reference and may not perfectly represent the adverse event. So it's like covering its ass. In this history, what were the most, so I found on the a web, a history sent to a drug company of cases. I said, in this history, what were the uh, adverse events likely due to TNF blockers? So it goes through, I get this whole thing, and it says, based on the clinical history you provided, there are several key points to consider. And it gives me, based, it read out of the history, resistance, ineffective treatment, off-label use, con condition aggravated. Automatic reading of it. Other points, the insurer denied coverage for the laboratory tests measuring blah, blah, blah. Antibody state of these tests are not standard of care. The decision to continue to increase or discontinue the dose of infliximab should be based. Here's the ICD-9 codes and blah, blah, blah. Would you like to know any more about a specific report? I said, based on all the adverse events for infliximab, could you create a warning note for patients? Notice I misspelled patients. Taking the drug with 10th grade literacy in French. Certainly. Creating a warning note that's easy to understand is important for effective communication. Here's a simplified warning note for patients taking infliximab, translated into French and written as a 10th grade literary level. Avis important pour les patients prendre de l'infliximab. Bonjour, si vous prenez le, and it goes on, and you know it says about the weight gain, about if you're getting worse and you should talk to your doctor. You know, like a big red bullet, if you see, feel one or more of these effects. Uh, contact your doc do doctor immediately. Would you like uh, to know more or seek me further adjustments? So at that point, I wanted to go to sleep. Um, so back to PowerPoint. So guess what? This works just as well for I2B2. And I'm not going to uh, demo I2B2 because I haven't done the work, but someone has, and you'll be hearing more about it. So a new I2B2 cell was created using their own large language model, and it allows you to query the large language model. So here you see, I want to find all patients with a diagnosis of acute respiratory infections who have been prescribing bronco, prescribed bronchodilators. And here's the whole XML message that is generated, standard XML message to I2B2. Think about that. All of a sudden, because you have all that data, on your fingers, because you have made it work for your institution. Now, all of a sudden, you can ask natural language queries of your data. What are the implications of large language models for clinical research? I think I one more slide. One is automated annotation. You saw how it could do the um, IC9 codes just like that. I can tell you for other terminologies like HPO, human phenotype ontology, does great, better than most humans. It allows you to create tools, as I showed you, to explore the data. It allows you to change the user group. This is important. The user-friendly or unfriendly graphical interfaces that we created are not usable by most of the lay public. And so, depending on what you think about the lay public, we've had a lot of problems with non-quants using this in, using the ITB interface to ask questions. But there are also some really interesting non-quants in the general public who could ask questions that actually could be robust. So. It's going to widen the, the user community with both positive and negative consequences. It also is going to create inter, interoperability. You can put in a fire message, a HL7 2.3 message, it will translate it into English. Or I'll take an English comment about patient and translate it into HL7 automatically. It's become, it makes less clear what should be our transport layers for these. And I'll close by saying, A, thank you very much. And I did indeed uh, take the incautious but exciting step to take on the uh, editor in, editor in chief uh, role at this new journal, spun off from New England Journal of Medicine, NEJMAI. And I want to invite you to look at the site, follow our already our very exciting uh, grand uh, rounds. You'll see a lot of very uh, interesting ones. I'll give you a foretaste. I think in a week you'll see Mark Cuban um, uh, actually uh, interviewed about this topic, but also we're looking for 
good manuscripts, especially showing real world use, and best of all, showing um, some real world evaluations. So thank you very much. Questions or not? Thank you for your great talk. So given the exponential development of GPT and LLM-based AI system, so what is the future trend of expert system? For example, IBM Watson system. So can we build a synergistic system combine the advantage of both sides? For example, can we use uh, expert system as a product engineer for LLM based system? So I think the short answer is, this is a, a bold prediction, but it's not particularly bold, that most examples of human intellectual endeavor from coding, engineering, to doctoring, the combination of the AI and these and the human, it'll always be greater than the AI alone. There's some exceptions to that, but by and large, it's gonna be true. So the challenge for you is to find the things that work today where there's a value added, because again, remember, whatever the deficiencies are, and I did not, I chose not to focus on the deficiencies of large language models today, but whatever the deficiencies are, they're very different next year. Gil, you have a question? Yeah, first of all, a terrific presentation, and I want to put in an endorsement for your book as well. The combination of the technology leader presenting the, the ideas about the technology and then having two physicians respond to how it actually can and is changing medical practices. Tremendous, I recommend it to all of you. Your example that you chose of biosimilars is quite prescient. Um, this is very important to physicians making decisions and to the payers and especially the FDA on the claims that biosimilars are as safe as and as effective as. My question is, is there a reliable way of, of fixing the denominators to actually make those comparisons in this kind of analysis? So I think that if I were the government, I would actually um, just take another database that I'm sure I could either get access to or squeeze access to, which is that of the pharmacy benefits management or managers or the large insurers. That would give me the denominator of number of prescriptions. And if I gave GPT or any other general model, so data that I just showed you, plus, okay. plus, the, <laughs> plus the claims, it'd be, it, it would do the join for you. Right. It would, and that's the bizarre part about it. And by the way, what, the reason it's so good at programming is the following. For us, programming is a weird, stilted, arcane art. But for a large language model, it's much more predictable than human language, much less complex. Computer languages are actually a subset in some ways of the kinds of operations that we uh, refer to squishily in language. Very good. All right. I think we need to go on to the next uh, meeting. So thank you very much. Yes. Now I want to introduce um, some really exciting work done by uh, Sean, who, as you know, was principal architect of I2B2, and with Griffin, who was probably the principal architect of Shrine, and has been a master behind the scenes of many things at Harvard. While I'm waiting, I just want to say, well, and what they're going to be talking about is something that's also extremely important for clinical research and potentially clinical care. The notion that we ha can have good and high fidelity examples of patients extracted from our data so that we can do things like trials and counterfactuals in exploring the effects of various interventions. But I, now I want to say something about Griffin while he's setting it up. So Griffin created something that anybody who ever has 
wants to make a referral to Harvard needs to have. Griffin, as part of something called Catalyst, created something called Profiles. Whenever I am told, oh, I have a, my uncle has a problem with their knee, and is there any stem cell treatments for the knee? I go to the Harvard Profile sites and I type in knee stem cell, and I say, only allow, so, uh, I'm a snob, only allow associate professors and full professors uh, to respond, in, and they have to be in one of the hospitals, so they're clinically active. And then it gives me a list of people ordered by evidence. And I say, what's the evidence? And it shows me what papers I published. And I routinely use this very effectively. And I get so much thanks from these patients. And I don't say, you should thank Griffin. I just take all the credit.